Why are man-made EMFs dangerous to the human body? How is it possible that a low-level non-ionizing electromagnetic frequency such as the one emitted by the phone or the laptop you might be using to see this video from, how is it possible that our cells are impacted when in fact these signals are much, much, much fainter compared to certain signals you're getting from nature. That's an example a lot of people tell me. I'm getting in the sun, so how come the sun is not dangerous? Well, it's dangerous to some extent, but I mean, I can handle the sun just fine or daylight, and yet the cell phone signals can be harmful to me? Doesn't make sense. We're gonna dive into this. I'm Nick, the EMF guy, you know, I'm an advocate for the safe, for safe technology, for this safe technology, for the safe technology, and I'm the author of the non tinfoil guide to EMFs. I want to dive into something a little bit more geeky than I'd like today, but I think that this conversation is very, very important. I'm going to share my screen and please stick with me here because it is important to understand what makes EMFs dangerous because if we understand that, it will also inform your decisions on how you can make them and those everyday exposures less dangerous so it will inform your priorities as far as emf reduction or emf mitigation goes i'm going to share my screen here there you go so the first thing i'll share is by the icbe emf group international commission on the biological effects of emfs electromagnetic fields I really, really love their work. I have to applaud their efforts. And um, this paper is very, very important. Basically tells you this. Why are EMFs dangerous? Is it that this is ionizing radiation, right? If you look at the EMF spectrum here, you have ionizing radiation on the right. Here, nuclear radiation, X-rays, certain types of UVs are ionizing as well, which is why it crosses over. And then you have visible light in the middle, and then you have non-ionizing fields. So the argument that is often used is, well, this is non-ionizing radiation. It does nothing to the human body. Well, for starters, non-ionizing radiation in the form of non-ionizing blue light visible light can still have a, a substantial effect on your body in the form of you're not going to sleep as much and with as much quality if you are exposed to a lot of blue light with the wrong timing which is after the sun went down so we already know that's not true when it comes to this paper, what I want to show you is this. The limits that we set for EMFs, including the limits that are supposed to make sure your phone is not dangerous, your laptops are not dangerous, and all these wireless sources, the limits were based on two major assumptions, that any biological effects were due to excessive tissue heating, and that no effects would occur below the threshold called SAR, specific absorption rate, and also 12 assumptions that were not specified by the FCC and ICNRP. I will not get into the the weeds here and the details, but this is an important paper to look at about why is it that everyone seems to still believe that non-ionizing radiation is completely fine, right? And basically, the reality is it's not about ionization. So what is it about? Is it the frequency? 5G. I hear this, 5G is so dangerous, you know, it's going to go in the millimeter wave. So it means here on the spectrum, you have a frequency for 4G and 3G that is, you know, between, let's say, uh, a little bit under 1 gigahertz, and that's 1 billion of hertz, 1 billion cycles cycles per second to about 3 to 4 gigahertz. But now 5G will go up to... I don't know, 30 gigahertz in certain spectrum that they want to buy. This is super dangerous. Well, guess what? Optical radiation, the visible light spectrum, starts in the hundreds of gigahertz. So 
It does not mean higher frequency is not necessarily higher danger. And that's something very, very important here. Higher frequency of signal does not equal, it does not equal, I don't know how to, to put it, it does not equal more effects. So that's not it either. What is it? What is it we're trying to find here? Let's explore. There's a very good paper to review here. Polarization, a key difference between man-made and natural electromagnetic fields in regard to biological effects. Uh, published here, Scientific Reports, uh, by Dimitris J. Panagopoulos, Johansson, and Carlo. Really appreciate these scientists. And they say polarization seems to be a trigger that significantly increases the probability for the initiation of biological effects. Polarization is something that is seen in man-made electromagnetic fields. In nature, we do not have this characteristic. We don't have to get into, again, the details of what this means, but it's a signal characteristic. It means that in nature, the signals go in all direction. They're not polarized. And that's how, as a very amateur in electrical engineering, that's how I currently understand it. So uh, please bear with me here. What do we find? And that's an important part. Real versus simulated mobile phone exposures in experimental studies. What I want to show you is this. If we have signal generators, that's a machine that you put in a room that is supposed to imitate a cell phone signal. If we use that and do a study, what scientists have found in this review, I'm going to show you in a second, is that the simulator is not equivalent to a real cell phone exposure. Why is that? Well, the simulator offers a signal that is one frequency and that is quite simple and stable compared to a cell phone. A cell phone has this erratic modulation pattern and pulsation and different signal characteristics that lead to more biological effect, just like I showed you a few seconds ago. So what does it mean? Well, Pan again, the same group, Panagopoulos, Johansson, Carlo, looked at experimental studies that were employing simulated EMF emissions, present a strong inconsistency among their results, with less than 50% of these studies with signal generators, right? The signal generators show around 50% of biological effects. So in other words, 50% of these studies with signal generators have negative effects on animals or whatever is being studied, cells, cell cultures, while studies employing real mobile phones demonstrate an almost 100% consistency in showing adverse effects. How would someone purposefully, willingly, try to publish studies that do not show a negative effect, that show, you know, there's no effect. Well, you would use a signal generator for starters. So there's been discussions, I'm not saying this is the case, but there's been discussions that the science we have on EMFs is being muddled, is being, you know, obscured with studies of poor quality. Among them, is using these signal generators and claiming that this is the equivalent of using a real mobile phone or a real router. It is not, because the signal characteristics are not the same. In other words, the Wi-Fi is more chaotic than a signal generator. Your cell phone, a smartphone connected on a real tower and downloading data and all of this is much more likely to, sh to stress you out, stress your cells out, compared to a signal generator. 
Hey, let me interrupt this podcast for a second. I want to tell you about one of the EMF protection or health supporting products I really believe in and which in the end also helped me finance the costs of this show. Most people don't realize it, but light is part of the EMF spectrum. It's a type of man-made EMF that you're exposed to. An excessive exposure to light frequencies that are in the wrong balance, namely in the blue and green color ranges in the evening can interrupt interfere with you getting a great night of sleep. It disrupts your circadian rhythm. And the number one brand of blue blocking glasses I recommend and use myself is called Bond Charge. And it used to be called Blue Blocks. Um, I use their yellow tinted glasses to reduce eye strain and improve my ability to focus at a computer during the day. And I also use orange glasses that are just perfect to put on about one to two hours before bed and they put you right to sleep. And what I like the most about Bond Charge is that they work, but they also look great. They also offer prescription lenses, which um, made my life so much easier because I don't need to bother with using contacts all the time every single night anymore. So to check them out, visit bondcharge.com. That's B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E.com and use the coupon code NICK15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order. Enjoy. And now back to the podcast. So what is it? That's going back to the main question. What is it that's stressing you out? Uh, How are these EMFs stressing you out? Well, Arthur Furstenberg shared that informational content might be even more important than anything else. And, And the informational content includes frequency, modulation, polarization. Again, the same thing as these scientists here have been saying, but this is a literature review from Russian and Ukrainian researchers from uh, 2001, and that's from the cellular phone task force from Arthur Furstenberg, so 100% uh, props and credit goes to him. So basically what they say is this, a significant if not main role is played by informational interactions. These are characterized by the transformation of information and its transmission, codification, and storage. So basically, biological effects associated with these interactions depend not on the strength of the energy carried into one or another system, but on the information carried into it. It follows simply from experiments that the energetics of external electromagnetic exposure plays no role even relatively low threshold levels suffice. Oof, that's a mouthful. Let me pause for a second here. What does it mean? What they say is this. A lower level of EMF exposure from your phone does not necessarily mean a lower level of harm. One unit of cell phone radiation might do the same harm as three units of phone radiation, to put it quite simplistically. How is that possible, right? Well, it's not the the curve of intensity of that signal that you could measure on an EMF meter. Intensity to damage is not a correlation. It is something else. Let's look at this. Intensity does not correlate with health effects or lack thereof. Does not always. Sometimes it does, sometimes not. Furstenberg talks about these examples. Roberto Becker, page 312 of The Body Electric, great book. The accumulated research has clearly shown that small doses often have the same effects as larger ones when it comes to EMFs. Researcher Carl Blackman showed amplitude windows for maximal effect for calcium efflux from brain cells. So it means that in brain cells, there is amplitude windows, certain intensities at which there are more effects, and above or below this intensity, there are fewer effects. Same thing when it comes to breaching the the blood-brain barrier. Some of the greatest damage were found at the lowest, not the highest levels of exposure. 
They concluded that holding a phone at some distance from you increases the damage. So Furstenberg said, distance from a source can make a difference, but not because the power level decreases, because it will interfere with the direct signal, kind of change that signal. Also, someone uh, that is quite important in the MF space, Igor Belyaev, also said in this expose here, 5G expose by Children's Health Defense, brilliant presentation. If you have time to go through it, I'm going to link it in the show notes. This, he said, duration is more important than intensity when it comes to biological effects. So let me stop sharing for a second and then go to the conclusions because I know this is a lot. The reason I'm sharing this is not to say that Creating distance between your head and your phone is not the thing to do. What I want to convene is that the scientific uncertainty that we have around EMS should inform how we think about mitigation. Okay, it should tell us, well, we know how the damage is happening, so our conclusions should be this. Turning off an EMF source altogether, like turning off your phone or not using a phone or not using Bluetooth headphones or, you know, turning off Wi-Fi on my computer and using an Ethernet cable to connect the router to the computer. This is way safer than lowering its intensity. So if I use a phone that is lower intensity, it might be beneficial, but maybe not. If I turn off that phone completely, for sure it's beneficial. So not using sources in the first place or turning them off completely and avoiding technologies that are wireless altogether, like I don't participate in the wireless earbuds. I don't, I don't like it. I don't think they're safe. I think they're going to be deemed relatively to highly dangerous in the future but that's my review that's my personal opinion based on what i know uh, as far as emf dangers go so we know for sure that turning off a source is much safer than lowering the intensity of a source of emfs hope that makes sense so far reducing duration of use is likely safer than lowering intensity. So again, lowering intensity is it's not clear how much it helps us, but reducing time of use is safer. Again, so again, instead of saying I'm looking for a low EMF computer, and that's how I want you to think about this. A lot of people ask me, what is the safest computer? I want a low EMF this. I want a low EMF that. Low, well, we don't even know if low EMF is sufficient to call it safe. That's the thing. That's the problem I have with that question. The safest computer is the computer that does not emit wireless. Period. The second safest computer is the computer that emits wireless, but you're not spending a lot of time in front of it. And then the next safest computer is the low, lower EMF computer, whatever that is, because it, so far it does not really exist. Same thing for the phone. Okay, so lowering intensity might help because it could reduce the biological noise we're exposed to, but it remains riddled with uncertainty. So this is how to think about EMF dangers. Turn off the sources, reduce duration, and then try to reduce the intensity by creating distance. And for sure, I would never advocate for someone to have EMF sources right next to their body because they're correlated with long-term cancer risk. So, so that's something. I'll share finally, as a conclusion, I will share the 3D system that Brian Hoyer, my colleague from Shielded Healing, and I have developed in the scope of our course called Electropollution Fix. You don't have to purchase a course. I highly recommend that you do so, of course. And I'm kind of, you know, tooting my, my own horn here 
uh, I think we've done a, an, an incredible job with the course explaining step by step how to lower EMFs. But here's the system that we teach our members in the course. 3D downtime that's your first priority is downtime the second priority is duration and the third priority is distance these are the priorities in order when it comes to reducing emf effects the effects that man-made emfs have on your health downtime means during the night when you are trying to relax when you're eating during the day might be also a good time that is considered downtime, but mainly in the bedroom while you're sleeping. Reduce EMFs as much as you can. The second one, duration. Cut down on duration. If you have a strong EMF source, but you're not exposed to it for a long duration, maybe it's not a priority. Or maybe you could work on reducing your time of use for certain things, like not spending as much time on your phone. And that's always good for your mental health as well. And the third one would be distance, because we think that creating distance will make it safer, but we don't know for sure. And it's a good reflex to have, but there might still be biological effects from everyday devices, even if they're put far away from you. That's just the reality. I hate that message in a sense because it makes it a little bit doom and gloom. But again, the safest phone is not the phone that you put further away from you. It's the phone that you put on airplane mode. And then you use your wired computer to answer phone calls like I do. So again, wired technologies, non-wireless stuff is much, much, much safer than low EMF stuff. And you're going to see on the market Mark my words, you're going to see a lot of products that are low EMFs, some of which I've recommended for different uses. Like, do I want someone to use the high EMF stuff or the low EMF stuff? The low. Do I want them to use a wired solution rather than wireless? Yes. Will everyone listening to this video all of a sudden stop using Wi-Fi? I, I guess I don't believe it. But I do recommend it, and I've been lit, I've been recording uh, the last podcast I've recorded. Uh, one of the last is on why I don't use Wi-Fi. I haven't used Wi-Fi at home for six years in this in this condo. So one way to do it is to go wired, and now you're doing the best you can to mitigate EMFs. I hope you like this content. It's a little bit more dense than I than I would have hoped <laughs> to do. And I hope that you like this information. Uh, please share it widely. And again, the message is just cut down sources first, reduce time of use, and then consider, you know, the creating distance and the low EMF stuff. But low EMF, for the moment, it's it's mainly a trend. And it could be a dangerous trend if it prevents you from mitigating these risks. So take care, continue educating others on these dangers, and do the best you can with this information. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. In case this wasn't already obvious, the information provided in this podcast is not intended to replace medical advice. We always recommend that you review this information with a functional medicine practitioner or environmental medicine doctor who is up to date with the latest information on the dangers of EMFs and the best practices around electro hypersensitivity, just to name these two things. And if you want to support my work, please consider sharing this episode with people you care about. You can also also invest in my book, courses, or recommended products found at theemfguy.com. Thank you.